Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part two of the section of the book titled Trace. In this video, we will focus on the trace of an operator and of a matrix. Let's quickly review a definition and a result concerning multiplicity. Suppose t is an operator on v and lambda is an eigenvalue of t then the multiplicity of lambda is defined to be the dimension of the generalized eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda. And this is equal to the dimension of the null space of t minus lambda i raised to the power dimension of v. Recall that we have a standing assumption that v is finite dimensional. We discussed the next result in a previous video. Suppose v is a complex vector space and t is an operator on v, then the sum of the multiplicities of all the eigenvalues of t is equal to the dimension of the vector space v. Now I want to define the phrase repeated according to multiplicity. Suppose t is an operator on v. The phrase with each eigenvalue repeated according to its multiplicity means that if lambda 1 up through lambda m are the distinct eigenvalues of t, with multiplicities d1 up through d sub m. Then we create a list with lambda 1 listed d1 times, lambda 2 listed the multiplicity d2 times, up through lambda m listed the multiplicity d sub m times. If we're in a complex vector space, this list then has the dimension of v by the previous result. Now we can define the trace of an operator. Suppose t is an operator on v. We break the definition into two cases depending upon whether a vector space is a complex vector space or a real vector space. Let's start with the case where v is a complex vector space. In that case, the trace of t is defined to be the sum of the eigenvalues of t, with each eigenvalue repeated according to its multiplicity. Next, consider the case where v is a real vector space in that case, the trace of t is defined to be the sum of the eigenvalues of the complexification of t, with each eigenvalue repeated according to its multiplicity. Alternatively, you could define the trace of t to be the trace of the complexification of t. Let's look at an example. Suppose t is the operator on C3, whose matrix with respect to the standard basis is the matrix shown here. We've shown previously that the eigenvalues of this operator t are 1, 2 plus 3i, and 2 minus 3i, each with multiplicity 1. Thus, the trace of t is the sum of those three eigenvalues, which, as you can see, is equal to 5. Our next result discusses the connection between the trace and the characteristic polynomial. Suppose t is an operator on v. Let n equal the dimension of v. The conclusion is that the trace of t is the negative of the coefficient of z to the n minus 1 in the characteristic polynomial of t. Let's look at the proof of this result. Suppose lambda 1 up to lambda n are the eigenvalues of t, with each eigenvalue repeated according to its multiplicity. If we happen to be in a real vector space rather than a complex vector space, then we should take the eigenvalues of the complexification of t instead. The characteristic polynomial of t, by definition, is the polynomial shown here, z minus lambda 1 up to z minus lambda n. We don't need to put any powers on those factors because we've repeated each eigenvalue according to its multiplicity. Now, expand the polynomial above to write the characteristic polynomial of t in the form shown here. Notice that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 up to lambda n is equal to the trace by the definition of the trace. Thus we see that the trace of t is indeed equal to the negative of the coefficient of z to the n minus 1 in the characteristic polynomial, completing the proof. Suppose t is an operator on a complex vector space v. Recall the decomposition theorem. That theorem decomposed v into a direct sum of the generalized eigenspaces of t, 
where each generalized eigenspace corresponding to an eigenvalue lambda j has the dimension the multiplicity of lambda j. We then saw how to use that information to choose a basis of v such that each eigenvalue lambda sub j appears on the diagonal the multiplicity of lambda sub j times, and we have an upper triangular matrix with respect to that basis. So in that special case, we see that the trace of t is the sum of the diagonal entries of the matrix, because the sum of those diagonal entries is precisely the sum of the eigenvalues repeated according to multiplicity. This is a very special basis we've been considering, but it leads us to ask the question, if we take any basis of v, is the trace of t equal to the sum of the diagonal entries on the matrix with respect to that basis? Remember that the trace of t just depends upon eigenvalues and multiplicities and has nothing to do with the basis. Thus, the trace of t is completely independent of any basis. To investigate our question, we now make the following definition. The trace of a square matrix A, denoted trace A, is defined to be the sum of the diagonal entries of A. Let's look at an example. Suppose A is the matrix shown here. Then the trace of A is the sum of the diagonal entries of the matrix. Those diagonal entries are now shown in red, and they are 3, 2, and 0, so the trace in this case is equal to 5. At this stage, we have defined the trace of an operator, and we have defined the trace of a matrix, but we have not yet shown any connection between these two concepts. To help derive that connection, we will need the following result. If A and B are square matrices of the same size, then the trace of A times B is equal to the trace of B times A. Notice that this result is a statement about the trace of matrices and has nothing to do with operators. Please read the proof of this result in the book. Now we come to a key result. Suppose T is an operator on V, and we have bases U1 up to UN and V1 up to Vn of V. This result states that the trace of the matrix of T is the same with respect to those two bases. Again, on both sides of this equation, we're taking the trace of a matrix, which means the sum of the entries on the diagonals of those matrices. Let's look at the proof of this result. We start by letting A equal the matrix of the identity operator with respect to the U's and the V's. Now, the change of basis theorem that we discussed in the previous video said that the matrix of T with respect to the U's is equal to A inverse times the matrix of T with respect to V's times A. And thus the trace of those two operators are equal, and we have the equation shown here. On the right side of this equation, we have the trace of the product of three operators, and by associativity we can group them in any way we want. I want to group them with the matrix of T with respect to the V's times A as thinking of that as one operator, and the A inverse as the other operator. Now I want to use the result that the trace of the product of two operators is equal to the trace of the product in the other order. In other words, we get the following, where again I've kept in red the term that we've permuted with A inverse. Now again use associativity to group the A and the A inverse together. Of course, A times A inverse is equal to the identity matrix. So the term in red disappears on us, and we get the following equation. Now if we look at the first term and the last term in this chain of equalities, both of those are highlighted in red, we have exactly what we want, completing the proof. We have shown that the matrix of T has a trace that is independent of what basis we use. Now we can prove that our two uses of the word trace are highly connected. Here's the result. Suppose T is an operator on V. Then the trace of T is equal to the trace of the matrix of T. Let's be sure we understand carefully what this result states. On the left side, we have the trace of t. Let's assume for simplicity that v is a complex vector space. So the left side, where we have the trace of t, that's equal to the sum of the eigenvalues of t, with each eigenvalue 
repeated according to its multiplicity. That's the left side. Now let's look at the right side of this equation, the trace of the matrix of T. So we're taking the trace of a matrix, which means the sum of the diagonal entries of the matrix. But notice that no basis appears here, and the matrix of T only makes sense with respect to a basis. However, the theorem we proved on the previous slide says that the matrix of T is actually independent of the basis. So we could put any basis we choose in. Now let's see how to prove this result. We want to show that the trace of T is the trace of the matrix of T for every basis of V. That's really what it states. But we only need to show that this equation holds for some one basis of V because then it holds for all by a result on the previous slide that the trace of the matrix of T is independent of the basis choice. But we already discussed in the complex vector space case that this is possible because we can choose a basis that's given to us by the decomposition theorem, and then everything works correctly. And for the real vector space, we just apply the complex case to the complexification. This completes the proof. You should pause the video and think about this deeply to make sure you understand what's going on here. The next result states that if S and T are operators on V, then the trace of S plus T is equal to the trace of S plus the trace of T. This result is far from obvious because the eigenvalues of S plus T are not necessarily equal to eigenvalues of S plus eigenvalues of T. However, the proof shows the power of combining our two notions of trace. Let's look at the proof. Choose a basis of V. Then the trace of S plus T is the trace of the matrix of S plus T with respect to that basis. That's equal to the trace of the matrix of S plus the matrix of T because the matrix of S plus T is equal to the matrix of S plus the matrix of T. And that's equal to the trace of the matrix of S plus the trace of the matrix of T because it's obvious that the trace of the sum of two matrices is the sum of the traces. We're just adding diagonal entries and that's how you add matrices, by adding corresponding entries. And now we use the reverse direction, the theorem that we used before, to show that the trace of the matrix of S is equal to the trace of S, and the trace of the matrix of T is the trace of T. And now if we look at the first and last items in this chain of equalities, now highlighted in red, we have the desired result. This completes the proof. The exercises at the end of this section of the book contain multiple interesting results about the trace. I've selected a few of them to highlight here. The first exercise is the following. Suppose P is an operator on V that satisfies P squared is equal to P. Prove that the trace of P is equal to the dimension of the range of P. In particular, this implies that if P squared is equal to P, then the trace of P is a non-negative integer. The second exercise is the following. Suppose V is an inner product space with orthonormal basis E1 up to EN, and T is an operator on V. Prove that the trace of T star T is equal to the sum of the norms of T E J squared as j goes from 1 to n. Notice that the left side of this equation, namely the trace of t star t, is the trace of an operator and thus it does not depend upon any basis. The right side seems to depend upon a basis. But because the left side does not, we conclude that the right side of the equation above is independent of which orthonormal basis we choose. The third exercise says the following. Suppose V is an inner product space. We'll define an inner product on the space of operators on V, L of V, as follows. The inner product of two operators, S and T, is defined to be the trace of S times the adjoint of T. What you're asked to do is prove that this is truly an inner product on L of V. Here's the next exercise. Suppose V is a complex inner product space and T is an operator on V. Let lambda 1 up through lambda n be the eigenvalues of T 
repeated according to multiplicity. And suppose we have the matrix of T with respect to some orthonormal basis of V. You're asked to prove that if we add up the sum of the squares of the absolute values of the eigenvalues, that's less than or equal to the sum of the squares of the absolute values of all the entries in the matrix. You can learn a lot from working on these exercises and on the other exercises in the book. This concludes part two of the video on trace. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video. If you see a small picture of part of the cover of linear algebra done right in the upper right corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the book's website.